Good evening, everyone. Welcome to, uh, to our, our town hall, our first town hall of 2021. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I, I've got to say, I was telling the faculty this morning, we had, we had our opening faculty meeting that um, there, was, there were a few people as eager as me to, to turn the page on the calendar that was 2020. Uh, I was pretty confident that 2021 was gonna have to be better. And, and lo, lo and behold, you wake up January 1 and um, COVID's not getting any better and that continues to get worse. And then you saw the, uh, the, the shocking images at, at the nation's capital yesterday and you just, I couldn't believe what I was what it's seeing. Mm -hmm. And um, I was thinking maybe 2021 could be worse. Mm -hmm. um, but, but one of the images I'm also gonna remember from, from yesterday as I was going to bed, I, I saw the uh, you know, order was restored and, and the joint sessions of Congress did meet and they did ratify the, the electoral college vote. And um, you know, you wake up this morning and, and the stock market opened and, and, and uh, I don't wanna forget or, or min, to minima, mi, minimize what, what happened yesterday, but um, life does go on. And I think that's sort of the, one of, one of the lessons for us going forward into 2021. Yeah, we, we, the COVID situation certainly isn't better, but there are reasons I, I think for us to be optimistic as we go into this next semester, especially at VES. Um, you know, one of them is we, we've got better technology. We've got vaccines on, on the horizon. And I don't know how far that horizon is out there, but, but that's, a, that's a reason for optimism. Um, our testing procedures and protocols are better, which are gonna give us a better ability to, to see what's going on with our student body uh, and, and faculty. Um, the other piece and reason I'm optimistic is, you know, we came into last fall with a lot of uncertainty, not knowing how we we're going to handle the pandemic, not knowing how long we we're going to be in session before the, the governor closed the school or closed all schools. And I think some of the lessons learned from this fall are that one, um, I'm really proud of this team, of our faculty. Uh, I think we did a great job of prioritizing the health, safety, and well being of our students and faculty. And so I know we, we can do that again going into this semester. Um, number two, I, I'm just so proud of our students. Your, your kids did an amazing job of rolling with the punches and dealing with the new life at VES. And I think by and large, if you ask each and every one of them, I think it was a really positive experience this fall. And I think everybody made the most of the situation, created new relationships, different relationships, spent more, out time, more, more time outdoors at VES than they ever have before. And, and I think that was a, overall was a really positive, joyful experience on, on campus. Um, and, and I think as we go into this next semester, um, I, I think we know, uh, you know a few things and we're gonna be, a, we're able to be more deliberate as we think about what's gonna happen. So as you know, we've talked about, we're gonna have a greater emphasis on in-person learning um, because we know we can do that now. Um, and we're gonna be more intentional and, and more direct about what we're gonna be able to do and, and, and some of the measures we're, and, and say, both the protocols we're gonna have in place and the restrictions we're gonna be able to lift. Um, the other thing I, I'm, I'm optimistic about and, and, and and feel good about is that despite the challenges, and I know we had some bumps in the road in the fall, and we're probably gonna have some bumps in the road in the spring. Um, I think we did a really good job of listening in the fall and making changes on the fly. Uh, it seems like every week we, we had uh, new, new rules and protocols being put into place because we were really, trying hard to one, listen to the students and, and we met with them every week. We tried hard to listen to you, the parents and both through these town halls and through the, the dialogues and communications we had with you all. And so um, again, it, it wasn't perfect and we, and we learned some things along the way, but I don't think you can, you can say that we didn't, didn't listen hard to what you all were telling us and trying to react and trying to make the best experience we could for the students under the circumstances. Um, so anyway, that, that's, uh, I, I know that uh, we're, we want to get into more of this. Um, and one of the things I also want to apologize in advance, I really thought coming into this call, we would have a lot more questions answered. 
and be able to say on this date, we're gonna do this. And on this date, we're gonna be, be able to do that. Um, but as, as I'm gonna turn it over to, to our, our, our expert in a minute, but given the, the, the situation on, on the ground and especially in Lynchburg right now, um, you are gonna hear some, I, I'm not, I don't know, or it, this is gonna be dependent upon situations on the ground in Lynchburg at, at that time. So um, again, I wish, and I expected uh, two months ago, we'd have a lot more answers tonight, but given the circumstances, we're gonna be doing the best we can. And I really hope that you will continue to put your faith and trust in us that one, we're gonna listen, we're gonna try to react. And but most of all, we are gonna continue to prioritize the health, safety, well-being of the students, of the faculty. And, and then we're gonna try to make sure we have an, as rich and robust both academic experience and, and student life experience as we can possibly deliver. So uh, with, with that being said, I'm gonna thank, I wanna thank Chris Lewis for again, his willingness to, to join us. If you didn't see him in the fall, Chris is, uh, is, is, an, is at Centra and he's been one of our key advisors in helping us open, open opening the school. He's also a current parent and a neighbor and a friend. And uh, he is probably, tired of talking about COVID, I'm sure, um, but was willing to, to jump on the call with, with you all tonight just to give you a, a, a picture of what you're coming into in Lynchburg. So Chris, thanks for joining us. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you, Garth, and thanks for that intro. Um, and like you, I think over the last multiple months, I've had to get used to saying I don't know a lot more uh, when it comes to the pandemic because we're, we're learning our way through it and it's been complicated and uh, we continue to learn more. So. Uh, I think it is the truth. We, when we don't know, we say we don't know, but we figure it out as best we can. And I think you all have done a fantastic job of that. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to be back. I've, I've talked about COVID in, in August and I'm still talking about it. I someday hope not to talk about it anymore. Um, but I also did say back in August when, when I was had the pleasure of being involved in your, your standing up plans for VES and seeing what you all were putting together and how much effort and energy and how well you executed. Uh, I really, back then, I, I did, I think I may have said even in this forum that if, if it was gonna be possible to do in-person in learning and sustain it uh, in a, an academic place, uh, it was, VES was gonna be able to do it. Um, just because, I, and I'd seen a lot of different schools, a lot of different folks looking at it this different ways, but um, if it was gonna be done, you, you were gonna do it. And, and frankly, you did. It was just, uh, just as a parent, but also certainly as a, as a physician, seeing how this was executed and how you ended up having a, you know, a, a semester that was um, successful and frankly, having no COVID on campus in the middle of a pandemic was, was amazing. And so I, I would give kudos to you and, and I'm very optimistic about the future of the next semester. Um, that being said, uh, I was asked to talk about a couple of things or three things tonight. Um, one is the lo local situation uh, in Lynchburg. And, and um, as you know, Garth alluded to, and as I think a lot of you realize, uh, the situation is not great uh, in terms of COVID. Uh, that you know, by comparison, when I talked to you all in, in the fall, looking at the hospital, we had, you know, at a peak, we had 45 uh, COVID positive patients in August. And we thought that was a pretty big deal. Um, and, we were proud of ourselves getting through that and letting that wane again. Uh, I will say we're in a situation now, uh, more recently where our peak was at 114 COVID positive patients. We've come down off that a little bit, uh, but that has very significantly challenged us as a system, um, forcing us to open many COVID wards. Um, and at the same time, by the way, try and take care of regular patients as well. Um, we've been okay so far with that. Uh, but looking at the trends, we do get nervous. And so, you know, a lot of this we think was the after fact of Thanksgiving uh, gatherings are mid, mid through the end of December really saw a ramp up in COVID activity in the hospital, which is about the right timing for what happened. You know, if folks gathered at Thanksgiving and got infected there, that's about when we would expect them in the hospital. Now, looking forward, we just had Christmas and New Year's. And so we're trying to holding our breath a little bit, what happens in the next week or two. Uh, and we're starting to see signs in the community that our case positivity rate is frankly quite high, higher than it's ever been, uh, to the tune of about 25% uh, 
That means about one in four tests that are run end up being positive, uh, which is a little bit of a staggering figure. Um, we haven't seen a second surge into the hospital yet, but we may well. Um, so it's known that it's out in the community. Um, the hope is that it will calm down potentially towards the end of the month, maybe into February. Uh, but for right now, uh, you know, as you open up your school again, you are in a bit of a different, we are in a bit of a different situation that Lynchburg is frankly much more COVID positive than it was back then. Um, that being said, uh, that, that's the reality of it. The, the, the good news story, which also was alluded to is vaccines and, and we, we are vaccinating now. Um, Lynchburg General started vaccinating uh, roughly about 21 days ago with Pfizer. Um, it's, and I can, I'm, one of my big things that I talk about is vaccines. So I can talk about forever that, that forever, but I won't tonight. Um, but the, the net net is, and you've heard this, is they're highly effective to the tune of sort of 95% protection. They are very safe. Uh, and Lynchburg General, we've administered over 4,400 doses already, uh, have seen no anaphylaxis, no severe allergic reactions. Um, we've seen some mild things like rashes here and there, um, some tingling, uh, but overall it's gone extremely well. And we are just now starting to give the second dose to folks because it, it 20, with Pfizer 21 days later, you're, it, you're due for your second dose. And at that point you're fully vaccinated. So we're already getting into that phase. Um, so currently it's all healthcare workers. Uh, we're in the phase 1A, which if you're listening, you, know, you listen to the vaccine stuff, that's what they talk about, the different phases. Um, 1B is what's, and well, let's, let me step back. That actually does have relevance for your campus because Centra is vaccinating all healthcare workers, not just Centra, but also in the community. And so your student nurses um, should be eligible to getting vaccinated. I'm not, you know, I can't say for sure, and it, frankly, it's a HIPAA violation to say it, but they are certainly eligible and may well have already come through Centra to get vaccinated. So you will have some members on campus potentially already vaccinated by the time your, the kids come back. The second uh, group of the 1B phase has not started yet in Virginia, uh, but it is probably coming. I mean, I would say likely in the next couple, three weeks at the latest, uh, we're going to be opening it up to 1B. And at the top of that list, if, if you saw Governor Northam talk yesterday, uh, he stressed that teachers would be, they're thought of as essential workers and they are high priority essential workers. And so teachers will be, as soon as 1B opens up for again, essential workers, also age over 75, but as it affects the campus, um, you are gonna start having a bunch of your teachers vaccinated uh, and protected as well. So um, again, that, the bad news story is that COVID really is ramping up. The good news story is that so are vaccines. Um, so things will be challenging for a while, but then they will be getting better and vaccines are, are, are gonna be a large part of that. Um, I do also wanna stress one other piece is that once we get vaccinated, um, we, we still will need to do our safety behaviors. Folks are still gonna need to mask. They're still gonna need to socially distance um, largely because of a couple of things. It is 95% effective, not 100%. So there is still some risk there, but also there is a possibility and we don't know this yet uh, for one way or another, for sure. You, one may still be able to transmit the disease even if you're vaccinated and don't contract COVID, you know, get sick with COVID uh, yourself. Uh, there is a chance that one could still transmit. We don't know, again, along with Garth, I don't know that, we don't know that, but we will find that out probably over the next couple few months as we study that aspect of vaccines as well. I personally think there's a good chance that you will not be um, transmitting, but up until we know that for sure, we have to be careful. Um, so the third piece that, that I was gonna talk about a little bit is still, we've talked about in the fall or summer when we were talking, a lot of it was talking about managing risk and how do you manage risk as well as you can for the campus to be able to continue to be in person to continue to not have that, you know, COVID spread onto campus. And so given the fact that COVID is very prevalent in, in the community, um, all of the safety measures that you all put together for the fall, you know, being very careful with masking, distancing have got to still be in place as well as in particular folks that are uh, the day students and folks in general that come on and off campus. The, I think your program was called Safer at Home or something similar to that. So, 
that still has to be very much in effect because given the, the, the our Lynchburg and the surrounding area has a lot of COVID, we have to be very careful with our, our students who will be at home and coming onto campus. And that means you as, you know, limiting the number of folks you hang out with. We think a lot of this community transmission, unfortunately, is because of gatherings at homes, particularly around the holidays. But in general, when folks collect in homes together, you, a lot of folks get together, that's how things, these things have been spreading. So um, I would just say, you know, in terms of how you move forward and open up campus again, uh, safer at home is still going to have to be, in my opinion, still very much emphasized. Things will start opening up. Things hopefully will calm down towards the spring. Uh, but for right now, um, I think we, we do need to be pretty mindful and bunker down uh, so that we can keep the campus going and, and be COVID free. And so I, I think that's roughly what I was supposed to talk about. Um, I'm happy to take questions. And uh, otherwise, I'm going to turn it over, I think, to my counterpart, other Chris, uh, Chris Button. Thanks, Dr. Lewis. Catherine, do we have any specific questions for Chris? I mean, what, oh, what, what I, you know, um, Jimmy Klein did ask when the VES faculty and staff would be eligible for the vaccine. I think Chris addressed that. Um, it's official. We're definitely in the 1B. Private school educators are included in that. We got that notice from the Virginia Council for Private Education today. And so it really becomes when uh, they, they start rolling that out. And uh, the VCP is on that. So we feel pretty good about, um, about that happening, um, as, as uh, Dr. Lewis said, in the, in the next, uh, next few weeks to the next month. So hopeful for that. All right. Well, um, Anyway, I, I, I told Garth earlier tonight, and I'll, I'll, I'll make a joke. Um, I said, you know, we should probably just bring back the dress code in full force, and then maybe we'll get some different types of questions. But uh, yeah, everybody's ducking and shooting daggers. So that's not happening. Um, but um, a lot of what we did, and we, we've said this in our communication, um, you know, unfortunately, with the situation the way it is, um, we are going to have to open in, in a way that is fully mitigating as much risk as possible. I firmly believe that if we can get our campus open, meaning the boarding students back on dorm and, and keep us COVID free at that point, I think to say that we're not going to have cases on campus in the, this spring is, is naive, just given the, the level of community spread. We, we currently have, have students that have COVID. We've had students that have gotten very sick with COVID. Um, and so that's something that if your student has um, tested positive for COVID, please let our nursing staff know because it does impact how we test. And that's, that's just an important thing that I can talk with you and our nurses can talk with you about what that means. But overwhelmingly, the mitigation strategies will remain the same. There'll be some that we're not doing. Um, much of the directional movement in hallways and things like that uh, we won't need, we will be very mindful of our ventilation. Um, one of my biggest concerns, and I think concerns in the medical community, is, is the variants of the virus um, and their ability to spread more rapidly. Um, you know, as we said in, this, in, the, in the fall, we did a great job with masking. I think our day students did an absolutely phenomenal job of the quiet life at home, um, as we had not a single day student uh, case that, that entire fall and, and only that one boarding case early on. So mitigation, I do believe, will look the same. Our testing program is going to be very aggressive early on. Um, the 72-hour PCR test before your arrival on campus. Once you're on campus, we are working on a plan to test every, every student, uh, both boarding and day at a certain time, using pool testing because we feel that with that first PCR test, we will have a low potential for positivity, and that is when pool testing is effective. If you're, you're testing a blind test into the community um, with the positivity rate that we see right now, pool testing does not work, um, or it's not an effective way to monitor your community. So the PCR test, 72 hours uh, before you get here. Um, I, I spoke with uh, uh, Dr. Tatum at, at PTC literally hours before this. They are still seeing 24 hour to 36 hour turnaround for PCR tests. Um, and so it, it, in, in Lynchburg, at least, um, that's very much available. If you do have trouble finding a place in your locality to get that test and get it done after the 28th, before the 31st, when students arrive, reach out to me because we can work on that. Um, 
Um, we, I'm having zero issues getting PCR tests um, back within 24 hours. Um, and so we can, we can arrange, but we really want you to, to focus on this in, in your community. You can certainly come to Lynchburg um, and, and come to the school if that's a last resort uh, for your, your testing option. Um, once we're on campus, um, we will test the arrival day and that will be a, a rapid PCR test um, by pool, and that will be done before a student moves on to their dorm. And Ms. Coleman, or Amy Coleman and Esther Johnson are, are gonna be putting uh, communication out there about the signups, because there will be, it's, it's gonna be a tight window, and we, we need uh, people to be on time at their prescribed times in order for us to do that. And then once we start school, we will move into our surveillance testing um, that will be more aggressive um, and certainly, um, uh, probably more often. Uh, I do say that maybe because that is three weeks away. And as we've found throughout this, um, things change, uh, testing strategies. We, we are now working with four different ty types of, of testing strategies and testing companies um, because there's a, different tests for different situations. And so we're working very, very hard um, on that, we believe it's a way to move quickly through what is going to be a tight, um, uh, you know, a, a really strict beginning to the school year. But because what we know and, and, and uh, we know from the fall, we believe we can move, but it does re really depend upon our ability to stay COVID free. The two biggest threats are an outbreak within the day community, outbreak within the boarding community, or whether our, our faculty become unable to teach because they're either in quarantine, they have COVID or they're sick. And so those are all things that you think about. And our goal is, yeah, we want COVID free, but ultimately it's to, to keep a small outbreak from becoming a large outbreak. Um, and that we will, we will work very aggressively um, to, uh, to avoid. Um, and Chris, before you, before yeah, you get to your next, um, yep. events, if you're, if you're shifting gears, um, for those people who are in more rural areas and maybe don't have, you know, a, a clinic to go to that can guarantee results as quickly as your thing, we can, can we, if they were to drive to Lynchburg, yep. can Absolutely. you connect them with Dr. Tatum or the clinic? Well, if you, we can do that. Them? We can even, so the, the difference is if you go to an outside source, a non-VIA source, you're, you're going to give them their insurance, your insurance information. We don't take insurance information and apply the cost. So we have to charge for those tests that, that we can do in our health center. Um, so if that's a last resort, we can do that. Um, but yes, you can come to Lynchburg and, you know, certainly the, those uh, services are, are, are readily available um, right now. Um, he, you know, as, as Dr. Tatum said, he, he believes it's, it's it, very busy right now. And as Dr. Lewis alluded to, we hope that that busyness will slow down um, as the, the month uh, plays out. But I am certainly happy to help anyone who is struggling to find the, the test. Your kids, all of them that are returning students know how to run our tests. Uh, they are pros at it because we did it so often. Um, sometimes it was an amusement park ride and we tried to make it fun, but uh, they know exactly what to do, how to run it. And so we, we, can, we can help in that. Um, but we, we, uh, the health center is, is somewhat open in that we have international students on campus currently. And so um, while we'd like you to focus at home, if, if you can't, please reach out to me and we can help you out. And on that note, I'm gonna pass it over to, unless you have another question. I do, I do. Um, do you know, at, at Hopkins Pediatrics, I think that families can pick up the phone, call and arrange for a test there as well. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't spoken with, with Efreet Hopkins. Uh, I haven't talked to him about, you know, day students and, and things like that. I know they're doing tests. Um, I don't know how available the asymptomatic uh, screening tests are, but I, I just have to do that work. So I will do that work. Great, we will try to let you know. Yeah, um, just one other thing on the quarantine. Um, there is a slight change. Um, we are asking for 14 days, the first seven days, really a quiet life at home. And given the, the, the positivity uh, 
right in most of the country, but you know, also in Lynchburg, that last seven days uh, before your testing, we really are stressing it, it should be no interaction with, with folks outside your immediate household. Um, we, we really need to do that. Um, it will allow your students to come back um, and, and go through that process of, of getting back on campus. Um, and, and so a positive test then does kick you out it, it, the 10 days. Um, the seven day, you know, we will work with the CDC and testing on that 70, seven day quarantine when it's possible. Um, and so it's, I think it's the 22nd or 23rd it starts. Um, and then uh, the, the last seven days are, um, that, that is the last seven days, it, it's really strict. So really the quiet life at home starts around the 17th. And that's all on our website and stay open well page. I should have it memorized, but I don't. So on to Amy Coleman for some positive, uplifting stuff. Hey, everybody. Um, well, get out your, your pens and pencils because I'm getting to some logistics. And I think that's going to make everybody really optimistic about coming back to campus. So I'll begin by saying that the returning boarders who are taking public transportation to get to campus need to be here on January 24th. Um, they should also contact mom or dad or the student can contact Sylvia Gates with that trap with all those travel arrangement details and Mrs. Gates can give you any you know help you with any any questions you have. All other students who are all returning boarders need to plan to be here on January 31st. And that is the arrival day for the bulk of our returning students and as Chris alluded to a very um, specifically worded and detailed logistical plan is coming your way in approximately the next seven days. So please look, pay attention to your inboxes. There'll be specific directions on that day. As he said, the, the window is going to be really tight because we are going to be a testing station. Basically the, the cars are pulling up, students are getting tested, et cetera. Um, it's gonna be really exciting actually. I can't wait to see how we pull it off. It's, it's been exciting to plan, I'll say. Um, also, there'll be a sign up genius for in your inbox. So make sure you look out for that. And you can reach out to Esther Johnson or me with questions about that after you get that, that email and the uh, sign up genius. If for some reason you know right now you have a conflict on the 31st and that, you know, for whatever reason you know we cannot come that day, please contact Esther Johnson as soon as possible to let her know and we'll make other arrangements for sure. Um, on to another point, if your child is waiting to hear about any of the following, a roommate change for the next semester, a room change for the next semester, even a dorm change for the next semester that they might have requested to move to another dorm, or if your child's waiting to hear if we actually have space on dorm, we've heard from a few students who said a month ago, I'm not going to return to, to boarding. And now after a month at home, they're saying, I would like to return to boarding. We hope you can come back. So you're going to hear that uh, the, the first round of that communication is going to come directly from Mrs. Johnson to each individual student after January 11th. We have a communication out to our international students who are still um, trying to make their way back uh, to campus. And for one reason or another, some of them might not be able to come. And so we have that deadline set for January 10th. Once they communicate their plans to us, we'll be able to act accordingly and communicate to all of you and your students what we can do for them in, ter in terms of roommate changes, room changes, dorm changes, or uh, if they can come back uh, to dorm. Hopefully everybody who wants to come can come. Um, and then uh, a couple of reminders. We will, brainstorming has begun for fun on campus next semester and planning has begun, don't worry. But if you, st we wanna go definitely return uh, to the place where we left off in the fall, which is student driven decision-making on activities. Um, I did, we, we did a uh, residential life survey at the end of the fall semester and we've taken the feedback students uh, provided and we're, we've made plans to apply those um, activities or changes to next semester. Some examples are our theme weekends, more use of the Pendleton kitchen for activities, you know, when students want to cook. Um, more, more feedback from students, uh, oh, you know, if you're, you're 
please encourage your students to reach out to Mrs. Johnson, especially because if, for example, on a on any given weekend, they'd like to, you know, make some ribs on the grill or cook some, you know, bake some pies in the kitchen. She just needs, you know, half a week's notice to make a shopping list and go out and get the materials. So please uh, encourage your students to communicate any, any fun activities they'd like to do. Even small groups are fine, just communication is key. And um, we'll be on after the first two weeks on campus, or after the, not two weeks on campus, after the, um, we're gonna look at the uh, situation on the ground in Lynchburg and see how that's doing compared to how we're doing on campus in terms of, you know, keeping our COVID numbers non-existent, hopefully. Um, and then we'll decide on when it's time to uh, open up our freedoms even more. We're hoping if the number, you know, if we're doing really well and the, the um, trajectory of, COVID infection in the community looks pretty good. We're hoping to get back to freedoms that we saw in the fall as soon as possible, including inviting day students to campus on the weekend, et cetera. Um, our goal is to get back to that as soon as possible. Um, another thing that we thought of what today was pack warmly. We are pushing ventilation. If your student, if it's cold out, obviously your students will be learning in indoors probably most of the time. I mean, but if at all possible, for example, I wanna take my, my class outside if it's warm enough, um, but even if we're inside, the doors are gonna be open. So it might be a little bit chilly inside. So they should have plan on wearing their coats to class. And, and you know that's just the, the exciting way we're gonna be learning this winter. Um, and then the last thing I wanna um, ask of everybody is you know, in the fall, we asked that parents um, really take seriously the idea that if you're going to drop things off for your student, that during the working day, you contact Margaret Lyle at the front desk. And if it's after you know, office hours that you really rely on that duty phone, that, that could not be more important than it will be in the next semester, that people do not um, contact their students and say, meet me in front yet and I'll drop some things off and we'll have a, a quick chat. That really cannot happen with the way things are on the ground right now in Lynchburg. So we really ask that you respect the, the protocol that during the, during the day you go through Margaret Lyle and in the evenings you go through the duty phone and you just text and say, or call and say, I'm going to drop something off for my child. And the duty person at night might ask that you just, they might be doing something. So they might say, could you just please leave it on the bench at, at front jet? And that's totally fine for you to do that. It should be contactless drop off. The key is that no more can you say, my child's gonna run out to the car and pick it up and have a five minute conversation. It just, it's just really, really serious that, and, and can't happen, unfortunately. And that's all I have. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. One of the questions um, specific to you is, what are the plans for food this semester? Um, whether that's larger portions or the ability to bring food onto campus um, through delivery options. So we will still have um, we, grab and go in the dining hall as we did last semester. Um, I, I don't have a, a specific answer about the portions, but I'm sure um, Mary Margaret is, she is extremely open to all feedback back from students. And we actually asked that she attend our um, stay open while student forum meetings, she asked to be included in that so that she could get direct feedback from students. So, um, and then um, we are still planning on having um, delivery come, but I don't know if it's gonna be in the first two weeks. We, we you know, kids are gonna be able to order their groceries, of course, and we can get that to campus, but to have um, Uber Eats drop food off um, is up in the air at this point for the first two weeks. It falls under the category of those freedoms that we want to get back up and running as soon as possible. We just need to be really careful those first, you know, it, it's roughly, I don't wanna keep saying two weeks because it really has to do with infection rates in the community and how we're doing on campus at, at mitigating um, you know, COVID on campus. Um, I do want to say that if students are are hungry and need food, please go back through the line. You know, they oh yeah, get, get absolutely the, the they, that, that you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. there's plenty of food in there. They just need to go, and they're doing a better job at the last semester. At the end of the semester, they were doing a better job of of going back through. And we have changed the um, 
we did listen to feedback and we are going to amend the times, the structure and schedule of um, seniors feel absolutely certain that they should be eating first every single time. Um, but we are making it so students, we, we tried it at the end and we're gonna continue. Um, they'll still go through in their cohort groups and get their food. And um, we'll ask that everybody get to go through once before seconds begins. And then there's a whole time period at the, in the schedule for, for seconds. Kids have started going through and grabbing that seconds to take back to dorm to eat as a snack later on in the night. Students should also rely on, you know, speaking up and, and asking. Um, I know like my advisees would come to me and say like, I, I sometimes I feel hungry. I'm, you know, by, or I'm through my groceries by Thursday. Can I come to you and ask you for help? Of course you can come to me and ask for help. And if an advisor is busy on a night and get, like say a student goes to Mrs. Anderson and says, I, you know, I'm hungry tonight and I ran out of groceries. It doesn't mean even Mrs. Anderson's on the hook right then to run out to Kroger. She can definitely rely on the student life office and communicate that to us so we can jump in and help um, figure something out. And th that's no trouble at all. Um, thanks for answering those. I'm gonna pose one or two more and then I wanna move on so that everybody can cover their com content. Um, and then we'll come back to more questions. But um, one that's relevant right now, and Chris or Amy can take this, is from the Watermans um, regarding boarding students who are returning on the 24th. Um, when they're quarantining, are they quarantining in their dorms or how does that look? Yes, yeah, so um, students traveling on public transportation who have to come early need to get a negative test before they travel. Um, and that is to protect our drivers from when they pick them up from wherever they're, they're landing or, or coming to. Um, and then they will quarantine on third jet and we will, uh, they will be tested on campus um, during that week. That helps, I wrote them in the chat okay. as well. Thank you, I saw that. Um, and then also um, a question just about um, day students and you know, are they are the same requirements that we had in the fall pertaining to day students um, in terms of where they are on campus. So the lounge in Van Every, um, bringing tubs for their, to, you know, to, to keep track of all their things. I assume that's the same, correct? Well, that is the same and actually more serious than ever that we, we stay separate right now. All right, um, then let's turn it over to Mimi to talk about the academic side of, of VES. Thank you. And first, I just want to say, Dr. Lewis, I was just listening to you on the radio on the way in. So it's so fun that <laughs> you're in the car. And now here I am. So I know. Yeah. So in demand. So thank you so much for making time. Um, and I think the the communication that just landed in your inboxes recently gave a lot of good information that I will just sort of reiterate regarding academics in the spring semester. The first being that on Monday we're starting our close to three weeks of virtual learning and um, we're in two days of professional development with our faculty right now and um, talking about making sure that we use at least 45 or 50 minutes of that time to be live and engaged with our students on those video calls. And um, we're workshopping different ways to, to do a great job with that. So I know I'm looking forward to the um, virtual school being an on-ramp to the semester as opposed to the off-ramp. Um, I think it gives us more chance to be a little creative and, and do some fun things when we're not in wrapping, wrapping up all the details mode. So I think we're, we're looking forward to, to getting going with the students again. It's the same schedule as at the end of last semester. So there'll be the three periods in the morning. Um, and then we, again, encourage students to reach out to connect with teachers in the afternoons. Um, for any extra help or one-on-one or -on -one support that they might need. So that's two full weeks and then three days. And we have the two travel days leading into our return to campus at the start of February. And we're so glad that things worked out um, in terms of risk mitigation in the fall semester so that we can add more in-person class time in the spring once we get to February. So I know there's a link to the schedule in that communication. We are adding 
one additional in-person class a week for each class of our of our seven classes um, in the rotation. So that means four class periods on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and five class periods on Tuesday. Um, so I, we we are prepping the students for this. I know my advisees were like five classes, but that's what we had done before. So I'm sure I'm sure they'll adjust. And we do um, just have a, a little passing period between classes too, especially to help um, faculty who might have to, to travel um, a bit of a distance between classrooms. So we're, we're looking forward to getting into that routine, seeing our students in person more each week. And um, as Garth mentioned, with that focus on in-person class time, um, we're making some shifts to what is provided for remote learners. And just like that communication said, we, we just want students here with us on campus. We know no matter how hard we try, there's no equivalent. Um, and our heart really goes out to those students who despite any of their best efforts, truly cannot get here due to travel bans or the inaccessibility of visa appointments. So as we collect that, that number and figure out exactly who cannot get back to us for in-person classes in the fall, we're finalizing a couple of different options we have to provide those students with direct faculty support. Um, so more to come on that soon as we really wrap our head around how many students logistically cannot get here for, for any reason. But we do want them to be connected to faculty, to have support. But um, for many of these students, there's a very large time difference. And you know that's been challenging um, to navigate from the beginning. But we're putting our best energy into it. Um, and for, for parents of sophomores and juniors, and, and the sophomore and junior students themselves just got this email, um, you should have received an email that came from Elizabeth Blom about standardized testing options in the spring semester. And again, we're so glad that we are able to provide school day testing opportunities for our students so they don't have to worry about going into you know, large gyms in, in other locations to take tests in environments where they're, they can't mitigate risks the way that we can here. So um, the first test will be an ACT on March 2nd. And um, you need to, in the email you received, click the link to let Elizabeth Blom know that your student will be taking that by January 15th. So that's by the end of next week. And then we have an ACT will be, I mean, an SAT will be offering on March 24th, right before spring break. And you need to register that for that by February 12th. And the school day tests are a little bit different. You don't go through the ACT website or the College Board website. You just register through us and then you'll be billed later. Um, and these testing agencies are a little bit inundated themselves trying to problem solve. So I think we were billed for the tests, gosh, three months after the students took them. So there's a delay there. Hopefully they're getting better with that too. And for our sophomores, we will be giving a pre-ACT in the spring. Um, I don't know if that date's 100% finalized yet, but um, we'll be giving that during the school day. Nothing you need to do to register for that. We, we take care of that. And we're looking for a time to give the PSAT 10 to those students who couldn't take it in the fall. So um, testing continues. And um, of course, for students who choose to test elsewhere on a weekend, there is that option, but we will have to look at the COVID situation and figure out um, you know, the quarantine after that that would need to follow at this time. And you know, hopefully all of that improves. So I Great. think that's, that's my update. Thanks, Mimi. Um, there are a couple of questions specific to academics. One is, at what point will parents have the opportunity to speak with the teachers, um, whether that's a meeting or, or some other method, um, to talk about the students in classes? Um, we um, believe that in the fall, we, um, we really missed out, I think, on having our teachers 
um, have an open house, even, even though it would be probably virtual with our parents, just so that you got to see some of them, especially our new teachers. And so we um, are hoping in the next few weeks that um, some of our teachers, we've, we've encouraged them to, to reach out to parents in their classes and, um, and have those meetings. So you should be receiving um, some invites from these parent, from these teachers um, so that you can get an insight to who they are, they can introduce themselves to you, what they do in their class and have a nice short Q&A with you. Um, it's not required of teachers, but um, I think a lot of them are looking forward to reaching out and they know that was a missed opportunity. So um, that should be really fun. Look forward to that. Great, thank you, Jen. Um, a question about remote learners. And I don't know, uh, Chris or Garth, you may wanna answer this one, but you know, we, we mentioned that um, there was a section about who can opt in and that the school is reserving the right to determine um, that there may be some students who it would be in their best interest to actually study remotely. Do you wanna to speak to that, Garth? Yeah, and, and Catherine, it's, it, and as you guys have heard tonight, you know, our focus is on in-person learning. Um, we obviously realize that, that there, there, there needs to be a few exceptions. So one, if there's a, you know, your, your, your doctor for, for, for physical or mental health reasons says, you know, it, this is the restrictions on campus just aren't working for my child. Um, they need to be a remote learner. Of course, we're, we're going to listen to that and always want to do what's in the best interest of uh, health and wellness. And, and then there's also, you know, there'd be a very small number of situations based on the fall, but it, it's, I think faculty, families and students the fall was a little bit of a, of, a, of a guessing game. You didn't really know what you were getting into coming back to school. We didn't really know what school was going to look like. And so we had a lot of options. Like you can be remote, you can be in person. We, we really talked about choice a lot in the fall, but it, this spring, it, it's we're, we're being much more intentional. We want to focus on the kids who are in person. We expect that if you can be here, you will be here. But yet we realize that there's still going to be, um, you know, a student who may not be thriving uh, under the, the COVID restrictions and, and, and is just not, what's going on at VES may not, be, may not bring out the best in that child. And so either the child is miserable or they're making the experience miserable for other students. And in that case, we, we can reserve, the, we are saying, you know what, this is not working out. Your child's not thriving. Let's why don't we try remote learning for or distance learning for your for your child? And again, I don't think that's going to be something we're going to spend very much time on this spring. But I just want to we want to be clear with our expectations. Again, yeah, I, I think we did a remarkably great job with the food. We opened up a lot of food options throughout the fall. Uh, Mary Weather Godsey is an incredible partner. Um, I think if you talk to any any boarding school, they they will tell you that everybody was was upset with the food in, in the fall, and that's part of just COVID world. But um, again, I, I think we're doing we we did it we did a really good job in the fall. We'll continue to work on it in the spring. But you know, I, I think by now everybody does know what they're signing up for. The first two weeks are going to be really really strict, like they were in the fall. But as Amy said, we're going to get back to where we were. Uh, in terms of introducing more freedoms and privileges as soon as we, we, we possibly can. We, we know that it's in the kids' best interest. We know that it's in our best interest. But um, again, it, it, I think by and large, the, the, the vast, vast majority, 95% uh, of, of, of the students had a, had a really positive experience. And, and I think the spring is going to be, again, a, a really good experience for the kids that want to be here and are, are going to do the things that we've asked them to do. Um, and so, I, again, I, I don't want to spend, I've spent too much time talking about something that I don't think is going to be a big deal, but I just, we want to be very clear with our expectations. Great. Thank you. Um, Mimi, a question has popped up about college visits, and um, this may be a tag team between you and Chris, but, you know, can students go visit college campuses and what is the state of affairs there? Um, and then what's the requirement um, in terms of quarantining to come back? Yeah, and I'll, I'll let Chris come in after in terms of our expectations, but I, mean, I know that some colleges have opened up options for visits 
in of some way, shape, and form. Um, I know we had some students over breaks have sort of like one on ones at some smaller schools, but man, you know, thinking about college students going back to campuses right now, um, there there's a lot there's a lot of unknowns. So I I think families first, and then us in college counseling with juniors. Um, and seniors who are going to look to try to make decisions just have to reach out to each school individually to see what they're offering. Most of the schools and the websites we are looking at still are, are not offering official visits, though I know a handful are. Um, so um, that, that's a conversation we can have. I know it, it's, it's so hard to make decisions when you can't get to campuses. The, the virtual tours are helpful. And in some ways, I know applications are up. It's very interesting to hear from different schools that especially in the early round, applications were up largely due to the fact that so many students engaged in virtual visits at schools they may never have traveled to see. So it's interesting. But um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't help when you just want to get your feet on the quad at different schools. So um, Chris, in, in terms of expectations there, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I would strongly suggest you go next week or the first week of spring break. Those are two weeks that would have zero impact on your um, school other than your virtual school that's the, or the virtual school that starts on Monday. That would be the ideal. Um, it's, uh, it, 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 it would work the best. Um, we do understand there'll be occasions where students do have to leave campus um, and go into uh, what would be a, a higher risk situation. Um, and with that, I, I, we, we are spelling out what that return to campus looks like um, with the CDC's new quarantine to exposure. And we treat leaving campus and leaving that quiet life at home as a potential exposure given community spread. Um, we're doing the seven day quarantine um, with uh, a test on day five and then a test on the, when you return to campus. So we're gonna try, we're going to test pretty aggressively around those, those quarantines. That's the plan right now. I would say that as always, all these plans can change um, um, based on what is going on um, with, the, with the, the health situation. So that is the current plan. My best and most direct is, you know, during this virtual school time um, and during that first week of spring break. Um, and that's the other thing I know, I got some questions about spring break. Are we gonna be able to travel? Are we gonna go on vacation? Things like that. Um, again, as I advise this, the, it was actually a student who asked me, said really plan that around your first week so you can have the quiet life at home at, at the, uh, the second week of spring break. And I know it's a long time off, but it's not that, that far off. So Chris, talk okay. a little bit more about that. The, the dates for spring break are March 27th through April the 11th. Um, you know, one parent's asking, it feels like that's long. Are we planning for a quarantine period during spring break before the students come back again? Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. So the January quarantine is 14 days. It's we're, we're saying quiet life at home with the first seven and then the second seven really uh, only contact with uh, folks in your immediate family. Spring break, um, we, I do feel that we're going to be at a different place in the pandemic. That's the hope. And so I do believe that second week with a seven, seven day quarantine and testing um, would, would put us in a, in a good place. We have answered all of the questions that have been posted at this particular time. So I'm, um, I'm going to take a moment to share the website. I just want to um, put this up on the screen so you can see what it is that we have set up for you to go look at. Um, but in addition to that, I would strongly urge you if you have a, a question you want to ask to pop that in the Q&A or the chat right now. Um, so this is our website. Um, you may want to jot this address down, but it's uh, ves.org slash stay well 2021. It's actually at the very top of the landing page for ves.org as well. So you should find it under the menu right at the top there. Um, we just like last semester, we keep this page up to date uh, with all the information that we've shared in the communication. We include the actual communication link right here. So if you didn't get the email, uh, one, please let us know if you feel like you um, truly didn't receive it because we want to make sure you're on our list. 
properly, but um, those communications are always linked to here. Uh, we always put the replay of these sessions out on this page. The international one is up from yesterday and I'll be putting up um, tonight's sometime um, by tomorrow, <clears throat> excuse me, by tomorrow afternoon. The schedule for your students um, January sessions is here as is um, the class. I'll show you right now um, what the class schedule looks like for February through May. Um, so just please know that all this information, these are quick drop downs so you can read all of the details. So here's another question about um, vaccines and, and whether Chris Lewis or Chris Button would like to answer, but what is the vaccine plan for students when the vaccine becomes available for them? So, so I can talk on, in broad strokes. So um, students, you know, children, kids um, really are at the very end of the list in terms of priority, um, mainly because yes, they can certainly spread it and they can get it, but in terms of getting sick themselves, they generally, their, their risks are much lower than the rest of the population. Um, the Pfizer vaccine is authorized for folks, uh, for kids 16 and older. Uh, Moderna, frankly, is 18 and older. It's just because of the way they set their trials up. And those are the two ones that are available right now. So given, you know, you know we'll figure things out, but given the rate of what vaccines are being produced at and um, how they're being rolled out and knowing that we have to get it to millions and millions of people, um, I would frankly be very surprised if vaccines were, frank, were an issue for our kids, you know, within this semester. I think you're probably looking more towards summertime. Um, and so I don't think it'll become very relevant for um, their stay at VES this term. Um, I could be shocked and surprised and suddenly everything works well and suddenly the vaccines are available for everybody, even at, towards the very end of the list, which would be our kids. Um, but, you know, I, I would look much more towards the summertime. One, one question that didn't come up, but we, we usually talk about is on February 1st, we will go into our spring sports season. Um, that does include uh, football, um, basketball will be continuing at that time. Um, and we'll be in the phase one where people, you know, it's individual skills and things like that. We really uh, decided to go right to the spring season for the, the strong majority of our kids because they're all outside. Um, and we are working very hard to create some of the opportunities to compete like we did in the fall with other boarding schools that are in the same mitigation process. And then um, on football, we're working very hard with that league to try to come up with a, a process by which we could possibly play some of those day schools. But that's all things that we are uh, in progress. Bob Lake has been working nonstop over the break in, in really trying to make sure there are options for competition. Uh, the note went out for the musical um, for uh, auditions for that from uh, I think Ms. Roop and, and Ms. Burton. So look at look out for that. So we're excited about our spring afternoon um, activities. Um, and uh, you know certainly there'll be a lot more information coming on that as we get closer to, to the start date. And Chris, a question about a swim season just popped up is is no. no. Okay. Swimming, the winter sports um, are, for the most part, not happening. Mm -hmm. And um, the parents asking if they have issues during the quarantine period where they actually need to be somewhere that maybe essentially violates quarantine, who should they contact at the school to discuss that scenario with? Uh, the, me and the Stay Open Well team, is, uh, Amy Coleman, certainly. Um, is able to walk through that as well. Great. All right. Um, well, we have covered all of the questions that have been posed. So I think at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Garth to bring us to a close. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you for all of the uh, everyone for being here tonight. And, and, and again, a special thanks to Chris, Dr. Chris Lewis for, uh, for joining us. Um, anyway, we appreciate the questions. And again, as, as I said, at one point, I, I think um, although we didn't do everything perfectly or exactly as you may have wished we had done it in the fall, um, I do think we were responsive and we listened and we will continue to do so. So if other questions come up or concerns, just don't hesitate to reach out and, and, and talk to us and let us know which, what, what they are because we will continue to try to be responsive to you and the needs of, of, of your students. And um, 
I know we are all super excited about the kids returning February 1. Um, it's just, it's still, a, even though we'll be in virtual uh, next week, it's still a, a very lonely campus without, without everybody here. So we look forward to seeing you and especially seeing your kids very soon. Thanks. Thank you all. Have a good night.